Okay, uh, hold on a second. Alright, uh, welcome to uh, this episode of Speed Coding, a Nintendo emulator. I am Assembly Assembly, also known as Sigflop. And uh, in this episode, I'm going to do a short tour of the source code that we have now, because um, it's likely to change um, structure a lot s right now. So, so I'll just take a, a tour as it is now. I have a microphone. And I started recording. I don't know exactly where to put the microphone. Here, let me try this. Hold on. Can I still, can I still hear myself? Hold on. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put it uh, in my shirt. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, can I still hear myself? I think I can still hear myself, quite frankly. Um, so. Here we are. The frame rate's probably not going to be the best on this because, uh, um, well, I should use a different capturing method aside from a uh, different capturing method aside from FFmpeg um, because I X org. Ah, it's just not meant for capturing that well. It takes away a lot of your bandwidth, as it turns out. So this is a uh, is our source code. This is main. Um, we'll just hop over to main here. And uh, what we do, uh, first of all, um, if we're on Unix, uh, we trap uh, signals so we can press Control C. Um, I'd like to trap those three just for whatever reason. Then after that, we initialize STL. Uh, we're going to initialize video in the timer. That's the only thing we're using quite yet. And uh, then we set a video mode. Um, width and height could be anything. Uh, for depth, I put zero. Since we're not going to be really drawing anything to it, you can put that as zero. If you're just going to have a YUV overlay, this is where we set up the YUV overlay at the Nintendo resolution, 256 by 240. The NTSC Nintendo resolution uh, PAL, I believe, is 256 by 256. Hmm. And uh, this needs to go. Um, I was worried that it wouldn't be three planes for whatever reason, so I put that there just in case that needs to go. Um, then we send a uh, resize event um, because of the resize um, hook um, in our events loop um, does a bit more to set up the screen size. So we just push that event onto the event queue um, so it can do that automatically. Then we open Mario, Mario.nes. We skip 16 bytes. Uh, 16 bytes contains the, uh, the header. Then after that, we uh, load up the two ROM banks. In the future, uh, ROM 1 and ROM 0 should just be one symbol called ROM. We can do with that in the future. Then we load up the pattern bank, uh, close Mario.nes, and we reset our, our processor, um, all the registers and everything to zero. And uh, it also looks up the reset vector and sets the program counter that. Um, we set up some of the surfaces for a background. Um, it's kind of a lame way to do it. Uh, probably should change that in the future <coughs> for some of our background data. We have um, set up a time. This is for our, uh, this is just primarily for our statistics gathering and also dropping frames. Uh, so this is our main loop right here, primarily. There's, there's a little bit more down at the bottom there um, that I couldn't scroll to. I'll go through this. Um, every four loops, uh, we check our input queue to see if we've gotten any keys pressed. This loop is a, is, um, is a CPU loop primarily because we don't necessarily draw a frame for every, every loop. Um, so in the future, we want to put that uh, have it every four frames as, as opposed to every four CPU loops. And uh, one iteration of these is uh, is one screen, pretty much. Uh, we set up the vertical blank to zero, if it was there. We set up the hit flake to zero, as well as the run end table. Um, for every scan line, we, we have a, uh, we have, um, a table uh, containing the name table, uh, which name table we're using, as well as the the X scroll because um, <laughs> we're processing per scan line. <coughs> Excuse me, and and those um, those can change every scan line. So we just store that into a table. 
uh, what we're doing here is um, we are processing um, a frame of CPU. We're storing all the changes, uh, end table changes, scroll changes, and whatnot, to a buffer. And then after we, we compute a frame of CPU, we um, compute a frame of a, a PPU. Um, the reason uh, that being um, we do work more work per frame. If we if we iterated between um, PPU and CPU every scan line, that would just that would kill our, our processor. It's faster to do big chunks at once. So for every scan line, we do this, um, and there are 262 scan lines. Uh, we execute uh, the number of cycles per horizontal blank. Uh, this is 114 um, cycles, and uh, our processor um, does our processor emulator does reads and writes and everything um, on a per cycle basis. It, it doesn't uh, have fetch cycles or anything like that. It doesn't emulate it that deep. So in the future, we probably should replace the 6502 processor with something uh, that does emulate fetch cycles. I don't know if that's going to be an issue for games, though. If it becomes an issue, that's what we'll have to do. And we'll have to do that anyway, because in the future, I'm, I'm keen on writing a 2600 emulator and a Commodore 64 emulator, both of which needs a more accurate 6502 emulator. So um, first thing we do is this. This is a complete hack. Uh, this is um, this is uh, looking at uh, sprite zero, which is a sprite uh, hit sprite, and seeing if our scan line happens to coincide with it, and uh, then we set the the, the PPU hit flag um, if that's the case. Uh, this needs to be more detailed. It needs to know um, what the sprite looks like, what the background looks like. Uh, so this was just put there. It's part of speed coding, just just to get the job done. That needs to change in the future. This is um, we this is us filling our name table uh, uh, array and our scroll X array with the current scan line run end table happening to be the current <coughs> the current end table value and run scroll X being the current scroll X value. At the end of the screen, we uh, assert um, vertical blank on the PPU. Um, if we have interrupts enabled, we also interrupt uh, for vertical blank, and that's it. That's our that's our CPU um, loop right there. Now this is uh, a bit of muckery to um, let me scroll all the way down. This is a bit of muckery to keep statistics uh, drop frames if we're not doing it fast enough. If we're doing it too fast, drop frames at 60 hertz. Um, that being right here, uh, 10 u second. If we're drawing frames faster than 10 u second, we just drop a frame. That's a. Um, that's actually a lot of our speed up comes from from doing just that. So um, all this pretty much calls is frame, and that draws a frame. Um, so let's go over to frame in ppu.c. Here's our frame. Um, we check to see if we're cutting uh, the if we're cutting the sprites on the left side of the screen. Uh, actually, this doesn't get used. Uh, it did, I think, in in episode two, but uh, I ended up not using it. Uh, so we want to re-implement whether we cut eight sprites or not. Check to see if we're doing backgrounds uh, and the sprites. Again, all of these are based on the PPU control registers, the flags in there. If we're doing the background, we draw the back. And uh, if we do sprites, we draw the sprites. And uh, so let's just hop over to draw back. Here's draw back. Um, this is pretty much copying name table, the name table data from uh, this array called name table based on what name table comes first um, and where the scrolls are and whatnot. And uh, we draw the actual sprites onto the background when we write to VRAM. So that doesn't get, get none of that gets done here. This is just pretty much like a one big copy. It's a little bit more complex. This is uh, for draw sprites. Uh, it's pretty lazy. This doesn't, um, this hasn't been optimized because it does, I don't think it takes too much speed away from it. 
Um, we only have 64 sprites. I believe it was 64 sprites. Yeah, 64 sprites on the screen at once. And it just goes through every one and draws it where it needs to be. Uh, that's about it. <coughs> so once we've uh, drawn the background and the sprites, uh, both of which get drawn in the same buffer, uh, we check to see if any of uh, the name table uh, array is dirty, if the VRAM has written to it, and if it is, we, we draw the appropriate data to that. I'm not going to go to draw it to the NT, uh, I'm just going to quickly go through frame here. Uh, then we lock our yellow overlay and uh, begin to draw our planes, this being uh, the, the uh, U plane, I believe that's chroma red. Uh, and uh, then this being the uh, the alpha plane, um, if we don't have raster effects. This being the alpha plane, if we do have raster effects. And our raster effects consist of this, pretty much. We have a ghost, we add luma to it, uh, we divide it by two, that's how the trailing comes. We add ghost, luma, plus progression, um, the progression changes uh, for every scan line, that way we get little ticks. And at the very end, I'm not noticing this noise, so I no don't think this works right. We add some noise uh, to Luma. And so all our raster effects are done on Luma. Now if you hop back to main, in the part where we uh, execute a uh, scan line, wh what this process emulator does is um, it calls back a few callbacks, uh, well, pretty much just one, uh, two. Uh, read 6502 memory and write 6502 memory. So read 6502 memory, uh, we do a indirect lookup in our memory map table. Here's our memory map table. And uh, this is the memory map of the, process of the, the processor memory. More or less, it's, it's not entirely accurate because uh, these are aligned. Um, I forget how much they're aligned. Uh, 65,535 divided uh, by hex 20, whatever that is, that's what they're aligned. And uh, so we have uh, RAM that calls RAM read. We have IO, um, one more of IO. This whole area does nothing. In reality, uh, a lot of stuff is mirrored here, so we want to to make that more accurate in the future. And then we have a ROM base at the bottom. A and it looks pretty much identical for the, uh, the right portion. So uh, RAM read um, reads the RAM. There it is. RAM is just an array. Uh, we take the RAM boundary modulus just in case we have uh, we have uh, something over it so it doesn't sag or anything like that. I go into an odd area of memory. Uh, whenever I access uh, arrays, I, I usually, I think it's a good idea to take the modulus of the array size because you don't want to walk over the array by accident. Um, we have ROM and uh, ROM reads and ROM writes, or RAM writes rather and bad writes. You can't write here usually wrong. Stuff like that. That's how the processor is emulated. Uh, the I.O. Uh, callbacks are primarily where the work gets done. This is how the processor communicates with the PPU. And uh, we have various registers here. Each switch here being an address uh, in the, P the CPU memory map. We can set the control registers Set up, uh, set up the sprite uh, RAM. In the Nintendo, we have three RAMs. We have the CP RAM, the PP RAM, also called VRAM, and then we have sprite RAM, which is 256 bytes. This is what this does. And uh, this is reading, of course. Um, so when you read the status, we get back the status, for instance. Um, some of these are 16, 16 bits. And uh, so what we do is we maintain uh, flip-flop, flip-flop zero, and uh, different latches, latch high, latch low, just to deal with the 16 bits uh, writing. Because uh, like uh, for the scrolls, for instance, you want to write um, 16 bits, uh, 8 bits consecutively. So we have to deal with the flip-flop. Uh, we check to see what state the flip-flop's in. Um, 
Well, that's ignored. That's uh, marked off. We change the run scroll x to that value if flip flop happens to be zero. Otherwise, we change it. We change the y. Then we uh, not the flip flop by one. So we flip it, and uh, it's pretty much the same thing with uh, the VRAM address. And uh, here we take the VRAM address and uh, we increment it. We pretty much load it into a a short here, so we can just add the short. Do we increment by 32 or or one based on the PPU control register? And then we put it back into latch low and latch high. And uh, sprite DMA takes um, a uh, an address, uh, multiplies it by 256. Uh, takes that in CPU RAM and puts it to sprite RAM. So that's what we're doing here. Value time is 256 uh, plus store plus the offset. I if you have um, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> that's the loop. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's what it does, and it copies that in test RAM. You can probably fix that with a mem copy, but I'm, I'm mem copies probably more than one line, and it's not in line, so whatever. These are the, con the controllers. Uh, to access the controller, the, the Nintendo controller is a shift register, and uh, so we write, um, what we do is we write, uh, we reset the shift register, and we write a strobe to it, and uh, each strobe we return uh, one bit, so that's, that's how that works. And uh, explained the more or less the uh, how it um, <coughs> the outline of how it hit functions. Let me go through the files here. <coughs> Excuse me. Debug. We don't use any of that really. That's the inline debugger. We used it in the first episode, but we're not using it anymore. We can get rid of that. Uh, Con debug also does that. Codes belongs to um, the emulation core. Um, Codes being opcodes. This is a big switch statement uh, for the opcodes. Our emulation core, of course, being M6502, uh, we have a header for that. We have make files uh, here, 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 and here. A readme. Tables.h, um, that's for the 6502 core. It relies on, on tables for flag results and, and whatnot, just for speed. We have I.O. that contains the CPU memory map I.O. stuff that we just looked at. Header for that, of course. Main.c, have to have that. Well, you don't have to have that, but I like to call it main. And a header for it, of course. Memmap, that just uh, put the function table in a separate file because I don't want to see it all the time. And uh, then a header for that. Uh, PPU, um, being the Nintendo picture processing unit stuff, where frame resides and whatnot and uh, the header for it. Now for um, the PPU memory access, we're doing pretty much the same thing uh, that we're doing for the, uh, the CPU memory access, where we have a function table um, containing the memory map. Uh, pattern read, pattern read, attributes, name table and attribute read, palette read, this being the memory map of the, the PPU. Whenever we write to uh, natrib, uh, the write function here is natrib write. Whenever we do that, we figure out what sprite would belong to that write, and then we we toggle that as dirty. Uh, so when we when we draw that on the frame in a in frame where we had this bit of code here, um, that's the dirt map. That's how we know what's dirty, and that's how we know what sprites to redraw on the background. Uh, palette writes uh, is right there, and that just sets the palette pretty much. Nothing too special there. The reason for a separate, um, for drawback being like a big copy from the name table array is because we still want to do color conversion, palette color conversion, stuff like that. Um, so we don't have to redraw the name table if we change the palette or anything like that. And uh, that's it. It's a, it's a pretty simple emulator uh, so far. Uh, what we're going to do for the future is um, separate uh, CPU and PPU into two separate threads uh, so we can lock um, frame drawing at a prefixed rate and uh, we can just pump out as many CPU 
um, as many CPU clocks as possible. This is a, a good scheme for multi-core or multi-threaded processors. Um, not a very good scheme, I don't think, for unicore processors, although I could be mistaken on that. I, I have to do some, some testing uh, for the next video to see, or after the next video, to see if uh, we do get speed ups that way for unicore processors. Um, but the context contextual swapping in the thread kernel might kill our cache like completely um, s since we're going to be swapping. Okay, that was my sync noises for key pressing. Sorry, the battery died on my recorder. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's going to be efficient, an efficient approach for Unicore processor, processors. Um, we'll see. And uh, that's it. So that's the tour of the source code. Uh, we're going to make it a lot more modular as well um, because I do want to run multiple emulators in the same program uh, because I I think what I want to do is have the menu to choose what ROMs you want be an actual Nintendo program. Um, and uh, I would like that in a separate like corner of the screen and what ROM you're playing on another part of the screen. So we need to make it modular enough uh, so that we can run multiple uh, Nintendos, get rid of all the global scopes and, and whatnot. So the structure is, is going to change uh, quite a bit. So thank you for watching. And uh, I don't have to type X term F A huge E Vime uh, anymore, but I will. Or Vim, as people like to pronounce it. I will anyway. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Yous, for watching. Subscribe, subscribe. Follow me on the Twitters. And exclamation point, the big book of face, or Facebook in other words. See, I'm not really that fast of a typer. I backspace a lot. It's just because I speed up the videos. Facebook.com slash sickclub. So thank you for watching, and take care. Later, everyone. Bye-bye.